We're reading patients. Hey, all right. We both spoke at the same time. This is the problem with counting down when you start. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, nobody so, knows quite when to go. So this is the podcast that we're recording. And so I thought I'd bring up on the screen our podcast screen. Hey, you go. You know, this, we're, this is our fourth one. And we have your brain on marketing, email marketing and cybersecurity, the good, the bad and the ugly. I think that's a, the ugly is the best description of that. <laughs> Growing cybersecurity companies, obviously, about our overarching methodology. So what, what are we talking about today? Um, today, we're going to talk about, well, I wanted to go back to some of the stuff we talked about last week, uh, especially concentrating on your um, papers on influence. And then what I wanted to do is take a look at some cybersecurity websites and see how they maybe are influencing or not influencing us um, according to your structure. Um, so when you there are the papers on influence, yeah, and then there's the scroll. I the, the scroll is the one that has those pretty pictures. So okay, sorry, let's do that. Share the scroll, I'll share the scroll. Right, let me just. I'm going to shrink it down so that. It, so one of the problems is that when you get this high quality stuff, um, and and it takes like you know a gigabit a minute or so, some ridiculous amount of bandwidth to see it. And, and I find that somewhat problematic. So I, what I'm trying to do is keep things in a size where you can still manage to read it. But all right, so enough. Of, see, that's me. I'm the techno guy and you're the market. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to close the door to reduce the noise level here. But so that's, I think, one of the ones we were on last time. Yes. So as everybody can see, influence is complicated and it's hard. That's not that hard. You just have to spend a couple of years working on it to understand it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What did you tell me the other day, Fred? It's it's not so hard that a couple of years of thinking didn't help me understand it. No, no, it, it's a famous quote. It's on uh, on all.net. Hang on a second. I'll just go there because I, I misquoted it at least five times. Ah, well, we don't want to do that. So I'll just flip the screen share over to the the other page here, so we can look and see. This is my the famous quotes that I put here on all.net <laughs> uh, at the bottom. I hear this is by Virgil Gligor. Uh, Gligor? I think it's Gligor. On a computer security issue, he said, I, if you think about it intensely for three years, it's obvious. Yes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Along with Napoleon Bonaparte. Never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. You know, I like that a lot. And the next one from Arthur C. Clarke is, of course, famous and also um, one of my favorite quotes of all time. But the next uh, one you've got, the, there's no limit to stupidity. That's yeah, this is from Dario. Yeah, yeah, this is, it's impressively true. Um, you know, and, the, and then, you know, finally, you know, I, I just had to put another one from Arthur C. Clarke in. When a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. <laughs> Now, I, I disagree with that in the sense that, you know, the limits that science identifies with things like the speed of light are still true. And people talk about, you know, these uh, quantum entanglement as something that allows information to go faster than the speed of light. It's not quite true, um, at least according to the actual physicists, you know, actual physicists I've actually talked to about it who specialize in that area. It's just interpreted that way. Um, so, and, and by the way, I always love to bring up all.net because it's full of content and it's a really good example of a website that people say, God, awful, what a terrible website, which I thought was the subject today. But, <laughs> well, well it, it, it is going to be, um, but we're going to frame it around your, um, your theory of influence. My theory. Oh, so just to be clear. Um, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, or in, in my case, I sort of kneel, you know, off to the side <laughs> of the hip of the giants because, you know, there are lots of people, you know, the way I built this out was I, I spent a year plus reading through uh, the research on, on various aspects of influence because I was working on the use of deception for information protection. Mm -hmm. This was in the late 1990s. Um, and, and so... And I had done this over time less aggressively and, and come across a lot of things. But, but so I actually had funded research. So I was, you know, we bought 50 or 100 books. We have um, copies of some previously classified, you know, summaries by the CIA of deception operations in the military around the world, you know, over a 50-year period. 
you know, we read through all that mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth, right? So, so, you know, we were just trying to understand and characterize, but it's almost entirely using other people's characterizations. Certainly this one is, um, and, and uh, as is uh, this one here, right? So, so these are other people's ideas, other people's ways of going about it. I just tried to learn from them. And, and, and the reason I put it on a scroll is so I'd always have it with me. So whenever we went on a gig or something, you know, on a, on a study for somebody, we'd have it there and we could just look at it and say, you know, what am I missing here? Mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Because yeah. it just yeah. takes a long time to get it in and the reminder sheets are very helpful. And what that tells us, Fred, is you are the cybersecurity or you're the, yeah, you're the cybersecurity Steve Jobs. You're taking existing stuff and putting it all together in a different way that brings different sets of values to it. Well, just to be clear, I have done you know quite a bit of original research as well, right? Yes. But, but the thing about research, you know, is is I think as a term, it's self-explanatory. It means look again, right? Research. Mm -hmm. So, so what we find is, uh, in fact, I just got a paper given to me by a, a a guy who's doing consulting for a company, and they're they're thinking of releasing this paper, and it says a totally new approach to blah 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 blah. And I look at this white paper and I'm like, well, let's see. First of all, I don't see the section that talks about related research. And, and I've peer-reviewed papers for journals for many years, and there's a lot of other related research using the same methodologies and the same techniques, applying them to the same thing, even with the same underlying data sets, just a little bit different. But they think it's brand new because they just haven't noticed. Yeah. So, so doing your homework is sort of fundamental to any field. And, and by the way, in cybersecurity, this is one of the big problems, right? People keep making these claims that are ridiculous claims to anybody that's been around or has done their homework or actually bothered to read the literature. Yes. And, and so I guess you can fool some of the people some of the time. And, uh, and, you know, that's, a, that's actually a very good, strongly related topic to our topic today, which is that, um, um, you know, these kinds of... Um, information transfers or restricting information transfers is not a good way to do marketing. It's maybe a good way to do influence campaigns. Um, but in marketing, what you want to do is have the, the core um, of what you're communicating come across in the first 10 seconds. So, you know, that, um, that kind of leads us to using this in a way that it actually happens faster. Um, and the way to do that is through a couple of parts of the brain, and we'll talk about all of that as we talk today. All right. Well, you can go ahead and start talking today because we've already been talking for almost 10 minutes. Okay. So um, influence is, when you look at it like this, obviously a complicated and very nuanced process. And if you could go back to the previous slide, Fred, there we go. Um, you can see that there's all sorts of um, nuances to this and all sorts of ways to apply influence uh, or how not to apply influence to the, the end result is you want to change somebody's behavior uh, in marketing that's what we're looking for so we went through the, the math of marketing the algebra of marketing last week where we saw that you know it takes 27 outreaches to get nine touches in order to get anybody to do so, something but if some of those are off-brand then you have to do those again because the people that are getting them don't know that it's from you. Well, also, if it's not following this kind of process where you're actually causing people to be influenced by you, then those don't count either. And you have to do more in order to get people to the point where they're willing to respond to you, send an email, push a button, whatever it is they want. Um, the, that number seems to have been true for about the last 40 years. It takes about nine touches in order to get somebody to do something. Even the social media marketers I talk to these days say that's still about the right number. Uh, so, you know, we just had a call with a client and, and this client has a lot of experience in social media marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I brought up the, the nine touches, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, he's all over it. You know, they, they know numbers from, from experience. And, you know, they're talking about, you know, it costs $500 to get one posting from a social media person that has um, 50,000 listeners, and that's going to generate, you know, 500 people pushing the button to your site, and out, out of those, 50 will come through. So that means 50 that become customers for $500 or $10 per, right? I mean, you know, and, and, 
and he knows it's not the exact number for this business, but it's, you know, he knows the numbers, he knows why those are the numbers, he knows what it costs. And, and that's the sort of thing, you know, in the analytical sense that we do in considering different go-to-market strategies, you know, to try and figure out which, but, but all of those fall over if the influence campaign isn't done right. I mean, you know, so, so what, it, what it changes is instead of, you know, having a, an influencer with 50,000, you have an influencer with 5,000, right? Instead of having that influencer get 500 people to click, he's going to get them 50 to click. You know, and 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 if you get 50 to click, instead of 500, then it's 100 dollars per. And by the way, they only expect to get 90 dollars back from every person, so you end up losing money instead of making money on that campaign if you don't do it. Yes, and it's very easy. The, the math is not difficult, but it's really easy to screw up. <laughs> I wrote, wrote an article about that. Just I published it on a medium just recently. If anybody here wants to go see my medium writings, hey, I hey, hey, wait. Wait a minute. You had somebody that intervenes between you and the dead. That you and you. So you're telling dead dead people. How's that going to work? Are they going to come back to people through the medium? Or <laughs> I didn't tell you about this new technology I've developed, have I? Wow, that's a, that's amazing. No, but but so how come you didn't put that on one of our pages and and make it part of? Oh, yeah, security growth. Well, that certainly could happen. It's not necessarily about security, but it's about a related topic. And yeah, but, so, how much do we have to pay you for that? <laughs> That's right. That's the idea. And, and, and so, uh, anyway, what this talks about is that the math of uh, marketing is really pretty simple and it's pretty straightforward. And where it gets pushed around and it stops working the, the way that it uh, should be predictable is that. People don't follow these rules of engagement or don't follow these rules of influence and or um, they're just going off brand. And so any of those things will cause a campaign to skew and not be able to produce the, re the returns that the, you know, the author of the campaign is looking for. All right. So I used to do mail order uh -huh. and, and we had standard analytical techniques for mail order. I mean, just, you know, off the shelf and, and, you know, oh, just to, to oh, so where did I learn those techniques? I just have to do this because I just have to. Wait a second. Let me share another screen with you. I keep this, this cover page on my desktop so I can show it to people at any time. Joe Carbo, The Lazy Man's Way to Riches. So I read this when I was young. Mm -hmm. and, and everything he said is true. And he provides a technique for for and and all the details of how to succeed in mail order right mm -hmm. so so when i i ended up you know the radon project in the 1980s went from um eight to 250 employees in less than six months and a lot of that expansion was because we went into retail but before that it was a mail order business so about a third of that was a direct mail um and then we went into the water testing business from there and the, and again under the radon project name and and, or, or actually it got relabeled to TRP because we didn't want to emphasize radon, for example, in water testing, but the same logo and house and everything. And, and we ended up using the same techniques, mail order again, going out. And the first thing we went to is all the school districts to, for lead and water and lead and paint because mm -hmm. kids are, are, you know about the lead and water problem, the lead and paint problem. Kids eat lead and paint because it tastes good. It's sweet. And so, you know, and it deprecates their capacity to think for the rest of their lives. And it doesn't go away when you stop. All the effects you've had up to date stay there. Right. So, so, so you know, really worthy campaign, something worth doing. But again, mail order techniques, right? And, and we had it calculated down to, you know, when do you take a check for less than the amount that you asked for and, and process it anyway? And Joe understood sort of all these things and he wrote it off. So that's Joe Carbo, which is where a lot of the mail order, so I, you know, when we went into the internet version of this and did this by email, it's exactly the same business, exactly the same model. The only difference is that the, the costs are lower per unit, but the returns are lower. Mm -hmm. So with the mail order business, 1% uh, uh, is real good for your calculations. If you get 2%, I've heard people claim 5%, but it's just not true. No, uh, it's rare, that's very rare. Well, I've, I've never seen it actually happen. Everybody that claims that when you go into the details, you know, you find out, you know, not really. <laughs> like they already knew about you beforehand or, you know, it was, it was a list you had already talked to before. Or something. But, but for the most part, you know, a, a half a percent is sort of what you calculated on for, for mail order. Well, an email, you know, 
the numbers are way, way lower, right? Mm -hmm. If you send out a, a million emails, you know, and you had 1% returns, that'd be 10,000 orders mm -hmm. from a million emails. And, and, you know, the cost of sending a million emails is maybe a couple of dollars, right? Um, it's just, it's just, you know, uh, the actual cost, right? If you go through a, one of the email houses, then it's a, maybe 125 for 20,000 email addresses, right? That you can send to as many times as you want. And you can get lists, you can buy lists for, you know, depending on the list and who you're getting it from, you know, five or 10 cents per, if you want to email them forever or less than that, if you want to have them send out the email for you one time. Yep. So, all right, enough of that yep. actual. So, and just to let you know, um, I used to work on a project called Bullseye that was a direct mail campaign. And actually there was, when we launched it in Japan, um, we actually had more than a hundred percent response rate. And it took us a while to figure out how that could be. And what it out was everybody thought it was so cool that they were giving it to their coworkers who would then be logging onto the site that they were referred to by the direct mail. And so we ended up with more responses than we actually sent out mails. But that was a particular product and a particular type of direct mail campaign. And it was very targeted and at the time, it was very fancy because you had a personalized URL and nobody knew what those were and it was yeah. all internet-y and woo-woo, but those actually, it was the okay. most so, amazing so that, thing. That's, that's called a viral response, right? That's a viral that's, response. Yeah, and everybody that because, the viral response, yeah. And that, the viral response is because you're providing this, which you see in front of you, in a very compact form. And while this looks complex, um, humans have a very intuitive understanding of this. We understand how to influence people around us. We may yeah, not well, know that know, using just, just this clear, structure. Just to be clear, scientists and engineers apparently are missing that gene. <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least I miss it and most of the scientists and engineers and startups that I've seen are missing that gene where they, they inherently understand. It. They, they uh, don't, or at least we, I'll count myself as one, you know, sort of refuse to admit it. <laughs> Yes, I know you consider it to be a weakness, but actually it's not. And you, know, you actually are extremely influential. So, you know, maybe we'll just have you talk to everybody and influence them for what we need to do. You'll just have maybe to talk reason, to everybody nine times. Maybe the reason I'm influential is that I don't try to trick people. It's really all about honest conversation. Yeah. And, and in fact, that's what marketing is all about, too. And my well, argument has business, always been that. No. Right there is the thing that engineers and scientists don't see and understand, and, and some marketers and some salespeople violate that principle, and, and they give a bad reputation to the whole bunch. Exactly. That's very true. And there have been several clients that I have told over the years, no, I'm not going to do this for you, because they wanted me to not be truthful. And beyond, you know, I'm happy to spin stuff well, but, you know, ultimately, if the, you say the product does X, it better actually do X. Um, otherwise, there's an old saying in marketing, nothing ever killed a bad product faster than good marketing. And so <laughs> that's a quick pass to death. Well, so, so honesty pays, but in the short run, apparently dishonesty works. So, so what did you yeah. want to talk about here? Because you keep talking about influence. Yeah. And, and this little diagram here is, is actually very nifty, talking about the relationship between power and influence. Yes. And so let's so go to um go to the Palo Alto Network site, Fred. And, and which site would that be? Palo Alto Networks. Dot com. Dot com. It's all one word. Palo, Palo Alto Networks. Palo Alto Networks. They are one of the largest. I got um, it. Cyber by the, by the way, providers in the market I, today. By the way, I, I know the the CISO of Palo Alto Networks. Uh, and in fact, they were a client of Oya when they were ten people. Oh, cool. Let's turn them into a client of Oya Security Growth and, yeah. and, and, you know, charge them an appropriate relative amount compared to when they were 10 people. Yeah. So, right, so here we are. Here we are. And I'm going to say that this is a quite successful website. The reason I say that is a couple of things. Oh, wait, well, let me guess. For one thing, it says Palo Alto Networks in the upper left-hand corner, so you yeah. know who it is you're talking to. That's one thing, and their URL is Palo Alto Networks as well. Wow, so it's consistent. Imagine that. It's consistent. So when you look at this, somebody has thought about this, 
and it realize that person or that team realizes that there's something important they need to say and that's what they say and that's all they say uh, the, yeah, so, the so what, what you, what you claim is important hang on what you claim is important here is social proof is social proof yeah yes the social proof is gardner says we're great we're great right and that's yeah. what they say yeah. they don't say and this is because of X, Y, Z, one, two, three, Q, R, Z, L, which would completely, completely muddy the communication that they were trying to do. Yeah, so I do want to mention that they, they have some things that I don't like. One of them is, we are the world cybersecurity leader, bottom center. Yes. Ready to take your security to the next level. First of all, they don't know what level I'm at, and, and it's a little bit insulting, and they're the leader. You know what leader means? Leader means... Well, they're not the biggest, or they'd say we're the biggest. We're not the best, or they'd say the best. It means somehow there's some people following us somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, you now, know. Now, now they do they, give you some numbers, right? Yeah, and, and, and I love numbers. 65,000 enterprise customers to power, protect billions of people. Yeah. Right? Okay. But note it says our technologies give, right, at the beginning. Where did so you see now, that? Bottom, bottom, I tried to highlight it, but it doesn't highlight that well. The okay. bottom line in the middle of the screen there, or above that. Where the, so the thing is, you know, technologies that I first created in the 1980s are, are used or, or at some point were used in more than 90% of all the computers in the world. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that, that I'm the one that sold it to them and they certain, you know, 90% of the computers didn't pay me a penny each. Mm -hmm. right? So being a leader, and our technologies, you know, that doesn't really cut it for being reality. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's much better. The number, 65,000, it gives them that, but are, are they paying you? Are they your customers, right? Right. Let's right. say our enterprise customers. So this is a, might be a case of putting, uh, let's say, the truth in the most favorable light. Yes. And... One of the things I'll say about Palo Alto Networks is they do it less than most other cybersecurity companies. They take a measure to right? in what they say. Measure, yeah, okay, that's fair. Yeah, um, they're not saying if you don't use us, you're going to die, which a lot of other cybersecurity companies do. And the point that I wanted to make about this slide is, like we looked at the GE homepage the other day, it was great because it supplied what the users needed. This is great because Palo Alto Networks knows its audience really well. Now, their audience isn't you, Fred. Um, so, no. <laughs> but, but that, that's actually not quite true, right? So, right. their audience is people like me, but but more specifically, people like me working for enterprises, right? They're about enterprises. They're not selling to small and medium businesses. They're not selling to individuals, maybe here and there, but but really, they're going after enterprises, right? Um, and, well, actually, actually Fred, let, let me correct that for a second. We we worked with a client last year that was a Palo Alto Networks provider. So they actually do work pretty extensively in the mid and small market, but they use channels to do that. They don't go after it directly, but they do have a lot of support in the channels. And this was a four-person company, and they were just installing and configuring Palo Alto Networks products all over the place all of the time. Um, so they do, in fact, so, um, so hang on, hang on. That the, small business was installing these in other companies, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and so, yeah, you're right, channel partners. But m my point is the focus is on the enterprise. Yes, right? the and, corporate and focus is, yes. Page, for this page, right? The reseller, right? Somebody who, who resells it to somebody else, they'll have a different marketing page. And they'll talk about Palo Alto Networks. And what they'll say very often is something to the effect of, Palo Alto Networks secures some of the largest enterprises in the world, you know, billions of people. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't they protect your small business? But, but we're the ones that can help you do that, right? Because frankly, Palo Alto Networks is too big to, to help you personally, but we're a channel partner and that's why we're here. Right. Right. So that's, by the way, I really do like the way this thing flips up. That's, that's a very nice graphical element that, you know, when you roll over it, it pops up and so forth. But yeah. so, so the decision makers for their direct sales, the people that would buy something after coming here, as opposed to coming here for information, those are people very much like me. They're, they're technical cybersecurity people. Mm -hmm. 
who are making decisions for large enterprises, and those decisions are made by groups. They're not made by individuals. Mm -hmm. So, so they are conveying here that Gartner, which is you know arguably the world's most trusted um, uh, advisory research and advisory firm um, in the IT space and mm -hmm. in much other many other aspects, um, you know they say we're top right and top right you know depends on the scale right yes. so basically this particular one says that they're leaders right right so completeness of vision is left to right ability to execute is bottom up and you note that cisco is down into the left so they're saying cisco can't execute as well and doesn't have as complete a vision of network firewalls right notice the figure one is network firewalls right, right? So, so yeah, that's probably true uh, with regard to Cisco, but then Palo Alto Networks historically is not actually a firewall company. So it's sort of an interesting, unless you look at the details, it still looks good. We like to be in the upper right-hand corner. Yeah. Um, and, and so yeah. The, the one thing I would have advised them on on this is to highlight their position in that grid because it's hard to, at least on my screen, it's hard to see. So yeah, that's why they have those big letters on the left that says eight time Gartner Magic Quadrant Firewall Leader. Put put a big arrow pointing from that to that dot, you know, something like that to reveal it. It, it would be better, yeah. But yeah. one way or the other. All right. So have we spent enough time on this site? I think we have. So, All right, so yeah. back to the other screen. Okay. Um, actually, what I'd like you to do is go to Cisco slash cybersecurity and let's see what they do. I'm not sure if I can do that. Hang on a second. Now that I started doing something else. So Cisco. Is that all one word, cybersecurity? I believe so on their site. Yeah. By the way, you know, you have to go into the cybersecurity part before you even get there. Yeah, apparently you can't go directly to it. Okay, so just go to the homepage and we'll find cybersecurity. I um, found a broken bridge. Wow. Yes. You say that, but up here they have Cisco Consent Manager. Like many companies, we want your consent to use cookies. You don't have my consent. Does that mean you won't sell to me anymore? <laughs> or let you let me on your website? I'm hoping <laughs> that they'll stop selling to me if I don't push the button this there week. Go. Okay, so what am I looking for? Oh, introducing the Cisco Cybersecurity Summit. There we go. That'll do. That's what we're looking for. Wait, yep. sorry. No, oh, oh, hang on a second. You keep so changing the, one, of, one of the things we can talk about is uh, uh, ease of use. Really <laughs> graphic. <laughs> <laughs> You know, hey, put up the graphic. Let me get there. Let me see it. Yeah. So this is Cisco relying totally on their brand to make this work. Because if you saw this on a regular website, you wouldn't know what this was. But because it's Cisco, they're able to do that. I just wanted to note here that it's still loading this web page. It's waiting for something from Cisco. So there's more to come, apparently. And oh, and I have to say, I'm not a robot. I hate those things. Um, but but all right. So so now you know. Since you brought that up, I just have to take you to TechVisionResearch.com. Oh, I don't like it already. They're telling you what they are. They are. See, you start to look at it. You actually do get some in the first seven seconds, but what is this crystalless thing? Nice graphic, by the way. That, that's interesting, yeah. It's a little complex for me, but it's nice. Yeah, just want to note that the date of the conference is right you know, next to the Cisco conference, but, but just, just so everybody knows, you know, I'm a, Technically, I'm a, a what's it called a something principal analyst super guy, uh, and I do papers for Tech Vision Research every once in a while, and I'll be presenting at, at their conference. So if they wanted to come there, 11 to 14 November, I'm sure that Tech Vision Research would appreciate it. But I don't get paid anything, so maybe. <laughs> so we don't. Care. Yeah. Now San Diego in the winter is a good place. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I would say you know if you're in the Northeast or somewhere cold or windy or you know hey. Go to San Diego in November, make the boss pay for it. November 12th, that same week, we have the Cisco cybersecurity, you know, virtual summit. Right. So it's going to be online from somewhere. 
Well, so you could actually attend both. Well, no, because the uh, chrysalis is a, a, a it, it's all happens, uh, it's a plenary session. So you can't sort of walk out of the room and, and go from thing to thing. It's all one thing. And it's uh, their architecture for how you do this is it's an ongoing conversation. But you, you could, you know, you could. Yeah. So you go, could back, record, go back to the, you could just record the virtual security summit and play it back later. In fact, yeah. hey, why don't I just wait till the recording comes out? That's what I do with a lot of webinars because I hate webinars. Um, yeah, so we have to sit there live at their time frame and they have a recording. Hey, wait a minute. We, we only provide the recording. Wow, we're just much better than they are. That's Cisco, right. Watch it out. We're going to take that. <laughs> All right, now we've hit more than a half hour here, so we really have to stop. So are we just going to continue this next week? or? Um, I, th I think we need a, a surprise guest next week. All right. Well, let's do that. We'll bring in a surprise guest. Okay, a surprise guest next week, and, and we'll tell them it's going to last 15 minutes, and, and after a half an hour, they'll say, I have another meeting to go to. <laughs> and we'll all laugh. We will at least faint to laugh, yes. <laughs> all right, Fred, I think we've reached the end of this week's podcast. Right, Bye, well, everybody.